Greetings, my fellow team lovers of Sovereign Thinkers. This is lo 3s Viewers Podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful Swampy Mangroves of South Florida. And today's date is Wednesday, January 23rd, 2019. I just uh, hit, had the mute button on my microphone. I'm like, oh, good grief. So I had to wing it. Hopefully it turned out good. Yeah, so um, there's some major controversies happening in the... Uh, State of New York pertaining to the law of the Reproductive Act, and it's so controversial, even the folks that are considered pro abortion on conditions are a little bit very dumbfounded. And a, fr- a friend of mine from a post on Facebook by CBN, so I did a little more research. I'm like, oh my goodness. And uh, I'm going to try to, you know, read the laws more thoroughly, then I'll do my intake on it for sure. But a lot of people aren't too pleased, especially when it comes to the state conscripting doctors. Do you have to do this? It's like a form of involuntary servitude. That's what happens when you got the state knows best, if you understand what I'm saying. So I'm going to probably check it out another time and give you more details on this. But first, yeah, let me talk about the new hype and hoopla about the Green New Deal. Yeah, you know, all those great so called role models that people want to glamorize and they can't even tie their own shoelaces together, with all due respect. However, this is a um, two part series, it's a multi two part series. And oh, Mize's uh, Institute did uh, share this. And it says here, The Great New Deal Debunked. This is by Robert Murphy. This one actually came out January 8th. So, and, 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 and part two just came out recently. Just came out like 20 minutes ago. So I'm going to say, it says here, There's a great ground buzzing around a new Green Deal spearheaded by newly elected Alexandria Caso cortez Although the details are in the flux, currently the draft text Call for the creation of 15 members selected committee for a new Green Deal that would also have the authority to develop a detailed national industrial economic mobilization plan to make the U.S. economy greenhouse gas emissions neutral. As if that weren't ambitious enough, the selected committee's detailed national plan would also have to have the goal to promote economic and environmental justice and equality. The draft specifically mentions spending $1 trillion over 10 years. Woo! Yeah! $100 billion annually, right? In addition to extensive taxes, taxes and regulations to steer the economy and society as the 50 committee sees fit is our way or the highway. To be clear, the draft text currently calls for the creation of the select committee, which in turn is then tasked with draft legislation forming a new, the Green New Deal itself. In this two-part series, I will strongly critique crit- 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 both sp- the spirit and substance of a proposed new Green New Deal. In the second article, I will focus on the specific proposals in the draft legislation. But in the first piece, I will give a historical context and explain why the very notion of a Green New Deal is misguided because it relies on faulty history and bad economics. The original New Deal was implemented during the Great Depression. Perhaps the most obvious flaw with anyone proposing a modern-day New Deal, whether green or any other hue, is that we are not currently in the midst of an economic depression. Even textbook Keynesians would think that, say, the incoming Obama administration was justified in administering a large stimulus package because we were stuck in a so-called liquidity trap now admit that there is no economic rationale for continuing to run large budget deficits. As Pearl Krugman notoriously and conveniently wrote soon after the election of Trump, deficits matter again. The very term New Deal was chosen to appeal to the 20% plus of the unemployed in the workforce who had ostensibly left, be, left behind by the traditional U.S. economic system. Yes, Ocasio-Cortez and his supporters are touting the new Green Green New Deal as, among other things, the solution to lingering economic inequities in the current system. 
but to call concern over a wage gap, a new deal is an inapt as Christian bullet train program. <coughs> Woo, sorry about that. Green moon shot. Just to let you know, I am at Squiggy's Pizza in the heart of Hemishi District of Fort Lauderdale. The New Deal actually hurt the U.S. economy and prolonged the Great Depression. To reiterate, even if you are a diehard Keynesian who believe in verge of the fiscal stimulus right now, with an official unemployment at 3.7% and price inflation rising above the Fed's target, it makes no sense to launch another New Deal. But things are worse because the Keynesian fans of FDR are wrong. The New Deal actually hurt the U.S. economy and prolonged the Great Depression. I have written an entire book on this topic, but here's one key table comparing unemployment rates in the U.S. and Canada. As you can say here, from 1923 to 29, average unemployment in the U.S. was 3.3% and Canada 3.1%. Then in 1930, it went up to 8.9% 8, 9, 8. to 9.1% and 9.1% for Canadian. And in 1931, 32, 33, you can say 33 is really bad for both nations. It's like from 24.9% to 19.3%. And it starts to trickle down, you know, in 34, like you know, right here, 21.7%, 34, and 14.5% for uh, Canada. <laughs> and it trickled down a little bit again to like, you know, um, in 1937, 14.3%. To 9.1, of course, and it fluctuated again in 1938, when unemployment went up at 19% for U.S. and 114 in Canada. Then in 39, it started to trickle down in the U.S. a little bit, and it still was um, unchanged in Canada. Then 1941, 9.9% in Canada was 4.4. This is from, the, uh, from Robert Murphy's The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal. Roosevelt was elected late in 1932 and was inaugurated in early 1933. president was sworn in on March 4th back then. As the table shows, unemployment in absolute terms remained awful for the next eight years. It was not until 1941 that the annual average unemployment rate got back into single digits, just barely 9.9. Even worse, fans of FDR can't simply blame the problem on a huge hole that FDR inherited from Herbert Hoover. In 1933, the U.S. employment was 5.6% points higher than Canada's. Next year, the gap widened to 7.2% percentage points, jumping ahead in 1938. Five years after Roosevelt is sworn in, the gap between the two countries' unemployment rates is 7.6 percentage points. In the light of above figures, is why is it that people say, say of Roosevelt, he got us out of the great out of the depression? As I asked in my book, what would the unemployment data have to have to look like in order for conventional historians and the publics to say FDR kept us mired in the Great Depression? Well, it's interesting about that because you say the banks were responsible, said the Federal Reserve was responsible for the Great Depression, and Roosevelt goes, "Yes, I will bend over for you." Paul Wahlberg and all those little lackeys in there, I will spread my rear end. And he just played ball with them. Apple polisher. <laughs> Green New Deal is a power graph for progressives. Although it is, of course, the cloak and the mantle of a peer-reviewed natural science, the Green New Deal is, is clearly a political program designed to check every box on the progress and the progressive wish list. For example, here's how Naomi Klein makes the case to left-wing activists to support Acasio Cortez against the establishment Democrats, pulling that a 45% reduction in fossil fuel emissions in 12 years, RPM. Off the IPCC report, summary states it's for, in, in its first sentence, it's not possible with singular policies like carbon taxes. Rather, what is needed is a rapid, far reach, and unprecedented pre, change in all aspects of society. By giving the committee a mandate that connects the dots between energy, transportation, housing, and construction, as well as health care, living wages, a job guarantee, and the urgent imperative to become racial and gender injustice, the Green New Deal plan would be mapping precisely that kind of far-reaching change. Wow. Can we say blackmail the people? I do. This is not piecemeal approach that trains a water gun or, or 
and w- trains a water gun on a, on a blazing fire by a comprehensive and hostilic holistic plan to actually put the fire out. Naomi Klein Bowen added. As Klein's discussion makes perfectly clear, this really isn't about climate change at all. That is simply the pretext of a fundamentally transform every aspect of society and culture the way progressive leftists have wanted to do even before people talked about global warming. Incidentally, the Kronoxic, Puddins, and Wonks who still plead with conservatives and libertarians to agree to a new carbon tax deal, which is theft, by the way, should see Naomi Klein the quotation above spell out, just like so many of her colleagues before her, they are explicitly saying the carbon tax is not close to being enough to achieve their environmental goals. So, really, we want to punish you for being alive. Ain't that great? Hooray! I was born on the third, so crucify me. But I'm, I'm sorry for being alive today. Please forgive me. I'll pay any, any, any penny I got for your pathetic, tyrannical claw, uh, claws and platform. It's the achievements. An inconvenient omission. There is more, more clue to clinch for the naive reader realized that the new Green Deal really is merely a technical solution to the problem of negative externalities. The word nuclear doesn't appear once in the entire draft legislation for the Selective Committee. Isn't it odd that Ocasio-Cortez and Naomi Klein think we, we have the 12 years to act in order to save humanity from climate catastrophe? Yet, they have the time to talk about fixing gender imbalances while they don't talk about a dispatchable, scalable energy source that's carbon emission free. This source currently provides 20% of U.S. electricity. There's a, there's a link for that. You can check it out yourselves, folks. I'll put this all in my footnotes. Fairness, some progressive outlets have grudgingly started taking talking about nuclear. But even the example of Gris only started in January 2018. The obvious explanation here is that these activist progressives don't really believe their alarmist rhetoric. Imagine someone warning that a killer asteroid was hurling toward Earth and we had a mere decade to do something about it. Then, the, then, and then these activists spent their time on funding medical clinics to treat societies down rotten when the asteroid smashed into the planet, killing billions of people. Some puzzled onlookers might timidly ask, instead of worrying about demographics, shouldn't we be building lasers or missiles to knock off the asteroid, of course? But the activists would explain, no, promoting heavy weaponry would interfere with our messaging on gun control. In that scenario, what would you believe the activists who told you we had a decade to act before the asteroid hit? Would their actions lead you to think they believe their own rhetoric? Exactly. Micro solutions to mega problems. Co- 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 conclusion. A new green deal, a green new deal, makes no sense on economic grounds, either in spirit or in letter. Even if one endorsed a heavy economic framework in the historical New Deal, works it would be nonsensical to implement such a program today, with very high peacetime debt let loads and an economy at officially full employment. What's more, the historical New Deal did not in fact work. In fa- did not in fact work, but rather prolonged the depression when the economy is already on the ropes. The last thing it needs is for more resources to be allocated politically or for more regulations to rain down from Washington. Furthermore, the rhetoric of Ocasio-Cortez and her supporters show that the Green New Deal is only a distantly related to the ostensible, ostensible scientific problem from greenhouse effect, greenhouse gas emissions. These, the people pushing a Green New Deal are using it as a vehicle to advance traditional popery. Popery, yeah, pop, pop, popery on the less political agenda. This is originally from the Institute of for Energy Research. So, <laughs> what do you say about that? Micro solutions to mega problems. Great song by Voivod, by the way. Off the Dimensions Hatros, so check it out. And it has one of those things, my friend. They want us to assume, they all believe we have an IQ of a turnip, and they, and people like Cortez, thinks she's smarter than everybody else. Oh, yeah, you know how that goes. <laughs> oh, man, I just have a great time talking about this stuff. 
And uh, let's just see what part two has to say. Uh, one of the hottest topics in, po in policy wonk in circles is the Green New Deal. Spearheaded, of course, we get all that there. In my previous post, I explained the premises. Bum, bum, bum. Let me see. Yeah, I will continue on here. In my previous post, I explained the entire premise of a current New Deal, whether the green, red, or blue was flawed, even on standard Keynesian terms. It makes no sense to embark on a $1 trillion government spending program with official unemployment below 4% and the Fed raising rates to rein in price inflation. Worse, historic, historically, the actual New Deal under Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt prolonged the nation's suffering, making the Depression linger for a decade. Finally, I pointed out that the supporters of a Green New Deal weren't merely in interest in mitigating climate change. They quite openly announced that they will use the plan as a vehicle for transforming society according to the standard progressive wish list. In the present post, I critically analyzed some of the specific policy goals listed in the draft text calling for a creation on a selected committee to a craft a Green New Deal. The various proposals would waste enormous sums of money in pursuit of the possible goals that would raise energy prices and hurt consumers. Even one believes that carbon... Hey, yo, how are you? Good, nice to see you. All right, I'll be right back. Good to see you. Good, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, now I'm going to continue on here. Oh, excuse me. Where am I? Ooh, yeah. I will just start back here. Finally... Finally, I pointed out the supporters of the new Green, Green New Deal weren't merely interested in making climate change. They quite openly announced that they will use a plan as a vehicle for transforming society according to the standard progressive witch list. Ooh, exactly, right? In the present post, I will critically analyze some of the specific policy goals listed in the draft text calling for creation of a selected committee to to craft a Green New Deal, the various proposals would waste enormous sums of money in pursuit of impossible goals that would raise energy prices hurt consumers. Okay, now I'm on the right track. Even if one believes the carbon dioxide emissions constitute a negative externality, the measures in the proposed Green New Deal would achieve emission reductions at a much larger cost than necessary. And we would once again, that the progressive left does not think a simple price on carbon is enough to achieve their agenda. Conservatives and libertarians should therefore be under no illusion when the idea of a carbon tax deal is floated. A carbon tax won't satisfy the Green New Dealers. Regarding this last point, considering the following excerpts from the Green New Deal draft text, frequent, frequent asked questions. Here's a question. Why do we need a sweeping Green New Deal investment program? Why can't we just rely on regulation of taxes alone, such as a carbon tax or an eventual ban on fossil fuels? Regulation of taxes can indeed change some behavior. It's certainly possible to argue that we had put in place targeted regulations and progressively increasing carbon and similar taxes several decades ago. The economy could drive transform itself by now. But whether or not that is true, we need to do that, and now, and now time has run out. Give the magnitude of the current challenge, the tools of regulation and taxation used use in isolation would now be enough to quickly and smoothly accomplish the transformation that we need to see. Simply put, we don't need to just stop doing some things that we are doing, like using fossil fuels or energy needs. We also need to start doing new things like overhauling whole industries of retrofitting all buildings to be energy efficient. Starting to do new things requires some upfront investment. We're now we're not saying there is no place for regulation. 
and taxes, and these will continue to be important tools. We're saying we need to add some new tools to the toolkit. Green New Deal draft tax, okay? The above excerpt confirms what I stressed in my part, in my part one of this series in reference to Naomi Klein's discussion. Proponents of government intervention on the progressive left have quite definitely rejected the notion that a mere carbon tax will be enough to deal with climate change in their book. Don't get me wrong, they want to, they want to impose a stiff tax on carbon dioxide emissions, as well as a 0% tax on high-income earners, as Ocasio-Cortez Ocasio revealed in her recent interview, but the point is no libertarian conservative should go along with a deal that ostensibly gets rid of that ener uh, other energy and transportation regulations in exchange for a carbon tax. The orthodox position among progressives is that such a deal will fall short of the necessary climate goals to avoid catastrophe. Such a deal would, wouldn't be acceptable to them, even in principle, let alone in practice. So to think about, right? Yeah, a Green New Deal would be incredibly wasteful. The Green New Dealers' desire for top-down regulation and massive new spending programs not only show the futility of a carbon tax deal, it underscores just how wasteful the program would be, even if one believed in a negative exter externality from greenhouse gas emissions, there is no reason to suppose that policymakers have knowledge or the incentives to correctly pick the proper ways in which the economy should adapt. Especially when we are realistic about the political process, it should be obvious that funneling more than $1 trillion in green investments spending through Washington will involve a gross mis misallocation of resources. For example, the draft text calls for retrofitting all billions to be energy efficient. They blank check to funnel money into coffers of politically power, powerful groups in the construction industry. Anyone who thinks these funds will be spent according to the social cost of carbon needs to watch a few episodes of House of Cards. Precisely. Alright, as I continue on here. Stringent fuel economy standards causes automobile fatalities. In the recent, in his recent, in his recent endorsement of a Green New Deal, Paul Krogman confirms that it should emphasize investments in subsidies, not carbon taxes. Ironically, Krogman and I, for once, agree that a political deal between conservatives and progressives is a no-go. <laughs> hey, I can't argue with that, right? As he put it, claims that a carbon tax high enough to make a meaningful, mean, meaningful difference will attract a will attract significant bipartisan support. Or a fantasy at best, a fossil fuel industry ploy to avoid major action at worst. After throwing carbon taxes under the bus, Krogman moves on to argue why the top down regulation of spending programs can achieve significant emissions cuts without imposing too much pain on ordinary Americans. How is this possible? Krogman explains the majority of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions came from electricity generation and transportation. We could cut generation-related emissions by two-thirds or more by spending the ending use of coal and making more use of renewables for or whose prices have fallen drastically without requiring that Americans consume less power. We could almost surely reduce transportation emissions by a comparable amount by raising mileage and increasing the use of electric vehicles, even if we didn't reduce the number of miles we drive each year. Krugman is quite flippant, uh, flippant in this above question with the word simply as if eliminating coal in which 2017 provided 30% of U.S. electricity is no big deal. Krugman says we can simply make more use of renewables without telling his readers that in 2017 non-hydro renewables accounted for less than 10% of electricity. Regarding the fuel economy, the simple fact is that in order for vehicles to achieve more miles to the gallon, automakers must be make must make them more expensive, but also lighter and smaller. That means more Americans dying dying in car accidents would otherwise be the case. How big a, how big a deal is this? Reputable studies have estimated that CF CAFE standards have caused anywhere from forty thousand to one hundred twenty five thousand excess vehicle fatalities. Of course, proponents of stricter cafe, cafe standards co could qu qu uh, quibble with these numbers, but the more significant point is neither Casio cortez nor Krugman 
if even that there is a, a trade-off, they speak or cranking up modest standards as if it's a mere technical problem without reckoning the tremendous human cost. Conclusion? A so-called Green New Deal is aptly named in the sense that the original New Deal was a massive bondoogle, boondoogle that restricted individual liberty and crippled economic growth. Besides revealing their plans for massive spending and efficient regulations, the discussion of a new Green Deal indicates there is no room for a carbon tax deal with conservatives. Well, 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 so it's like, all oh, hell, the big government, when they know best, it turns to crap. That's how you gotta look at this, folks. It's like the, the New Deal from during the FDR administration. Of course, he sold his rear end to the Federal Reserve. You, you got more bigger government than ever before. Yes, history is trying to repeat itself once again. So remember, my friends, never ever believe the hype. And I do support hemp fuel run engines. It was used, it was, it was done and released in the December edition, 1942 of, uh, 19, December 1942 edition of Popper Mechanics and Henry Ford designed an engine that runs hemp fuel. Nothing wrong with that, which it should have been done a long time ago, but you got the big oil companies crying and complaining to the government, help us, we can't, we'll be out of business. Stop this now. And the bureaucrats said, okay. We'll pat you on the head like a bunch of little peons, and boom, they didn't do it. Now what's happening, um, there are actually vehicles being designed that run hemp fuel right now, which is awesome. There's one that happened, one the designer happened, and then the Keys did it. And I did an article on that years ago. You should just check it out. So, hey, never believe the hype. And Ocasio-Cortez is giving you another wet dream extravaganza. And so is Naomi Klein, too. Remember, never believe the hype. All right, one more here. It's in reference to the Mises Institute once again. I always like their work. Is it, they, they, you know, because they have a good amount of merit and what they do. So I always admire that. And this one here, Venezuela economy collapses was enabled by a central bank. Came out a few days ago by, or yesterday by Maria Herat. One of the most remarkable aspects of the economic meltdown in Venezuela is just how far the country has fallen in terms of economic prosperity. After all, Venezuela was the fourth richest economy in the world in the 1950s. The Venezuelan currency, the, Bolo, the Bolivar, was one of Latin America's strongest currencies during the Venezuela's peak from the 1950s to 1970s. However, the economic meltdown in Venezuela has its origins, in part, in the founding of the Venezuelan Central Bank in 1939. Can I say it again? Venezuelan Central Bank in 1939. This was followed by a nationalization of the oil industry in the 1970s by Venezuelan President Carlos Andres Perez, which was, a, which was coupled with the Central Bank's easy money policies. The final crisis has come with the socialist communist measures over the past 20 years. Rising oil prices in the 1970s brought wild speculation in Venezuela. State agencies and private enterprises continuously encourage and engage in massive amounts of loans and unregulated corrupt banking system. The naive, the naive belief that an everlasting boom could be sustained, the nation's central bank helped fuel the fire. Oil revenues have reached a peak during Carlos Andres Perez's presidency, but despite the incredible amount of oil revenues, the national debt reached unprecedented levels. As oil prices eventually collapsed in the 1980s, the bubble burst and Venezuela suffered a banking crisis followed by a deep recession. Governments used the easy money policies from the supposedly independent central bank was in full swing and the government used inflationary monetary policy to finance ever higher levels of government spending. This was the beginning of the end. Eventually, debts began to go bad and the banking crisis brought, it, brought with it a current crisis as the Venezuelan Bolivar suffered this first major devaluation of nearly 100% on the on the, on, on the so-called Black Friday of February 18, 1983. The Bolivar was never recovered to its pre-crisis levels and has surfaced even larger devaluations since. When everyone thought that the economy crisis couldn't get any worse, then the Venezuelan presidential candidate Hugo Chavez was able to capitalize on the economic instability 
plague in the 1990s and the win in the 1998 presidential elections. His presidency turned to a full-blown socialist communist regime born an agenda of widespread nationalization of private industry. Chavez's anti-growth policies brought Venezuela to its knees and ultimately destroyed the economy. But none of this could have been possible without the central bank, which enabled the regime to finance on its own program with endless waves of money printing. This leads to price inflation, which the regime then attempt to fight with price control, prince, uh, prince controls. This has some of the most devastating effects of the Venezuelan economy, according to John Hopkins' study by Maria Bel Belin Wu. In 2003, Chavez installed a price, con price control for essential consumer products, which increased supply shortages of an average of 5 to 22.2% in 2013, the last record published by the central bank. Currently, in, 19, in 2016, the shortage of products in the basic household consumption basket, basket has quadrupled and stands at 41.3%. The exponential increase in Venezuela's monetary base, as well as an official CPI inflation, had devastating effects on the economy and the whole and society as a whole. The continuous devaluation of the Bolivar, uh, I hope I pronounced that right, occurred with such speed and momentum that in January 2008, the government decided to create a new currency, the Bolaferte, by eliminating three zeros from the old currency, obviously this did not eliminate the core problem. The last two decades have been marked by the Venezuelan government nationalization of the banks. As the late Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez nationalized the banks, he added that clients of the banks should not be alarmed. For those who have their savings in the bank, don't worry. You will be more than guaranteed in the hands of the Republic. You know the banking sector of Venezuela is one of the most solid in the world. According to Steve Hank, Hank and Nicholas Cross in Inflation by the Decades 2000s, report Venezuela stood at number seven in the world inflation ranking for 2000-2009 with a cumulative rate of 567.7% in this period was only the beginning of the crisis. Hank calculates the current hyperinflation of Venezuela is running at 48,760% at year as of December 2018. Today, at least 30% of Venezuelans face starvation, food, medicine shortages, and no health care. The humanitarian crisis is currently taking place in a country that had once had one of the highest standards of living in the world, and there is a tragic example of how a once prosperous country with a vast amount of resources could become a failed state to vast government mismanagement and corruption through a central banking system and through monetary policy. And that is a fact on that. And it's very disturbing as well. And this is why, my friends, the central banks are deplorable, unacceptable, and needs to be abolished. To, I say, the hell with Karl Marx's legacy on central banks. All you gotta do is read the Communist Manifesto. He was for that. Because he spread his butt cheeks to these people as well. The past is today's greatest teacher, my friends. That happened in the 1920s of the Weimar Republic. Follow the Reichsmark. Same thing. Nothing new at all, right? That's why the banks like the Federal Reserve, these people need to be thrown in prison, need to be charged for treason. It should not be allowed in there in the first place. Even Woodrow Wilson, who signed it, said that was the biggest mistake he made. And now what you see in the states are doing, are, are really pushing for using gold and silver as financial transactions, which is legal under Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution. It's time to tell the Federal Reserve to stick it. Because they're nothing without us. Tell them your Hamiltonian ideology will shred into oblivion. And that is it. I thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download the show throughout the social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or you say something that's interesting you want to check out, whatever you do, please send your correspondence to the quorum. Plus, I will leave all my footnotes on my speaker page. All right, my friends, once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is helping for the film, Candle Brady Maddie. Until next time, take care of yourselves.
keep on spreading the love, and may your guardian spirits be with you.